Good morning. Good morning, Revive. Good morning. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Woo! How many of you are glad to be the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, you are the church. Amen. Say it again. <laughs> yeah. All right. We, uh, Jen, you've got a testimony this yeah, morning, yeah, don't yeah. you? Where's Sarah at? Sarah Morehouse. I know my daughter's thinking, what? My daughter's name is Sarah, too, and she looked at me like, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. Can, can you hear this mic? Turn it up a little bit, JC. Just making sure. So I want, I want you to listen to this quick testimony um, from Sarah. Um, so last weekend, I was golfing with Clinton Jen, and then we ended up going to Chris Overstreet's uh, revival kind of movement. And while we were there, I didn't even realize at the time, and before I went, one of my friends had asked, he was like, why do you want to go to this? And I was like, I haven't been to Infusion Church in a while. I don't really have a reason, but I just feel like it's been on my heart. I felt this pull to go. So we get there, and then we find out that they're doing baptisms, uh, and Clinton and Jen were sitting next to me, and I just felt like God was pulling me towards it, and I was like, I don't know that I can do it. So I'm sitting there praying, being like, I, all I have to do is turn to Clinton and Jen and ask them to do it, and I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, I don't know that I have the strength to do this, and then Jen just turns to me, and she's like, Sarah, have you ever been baptized? And I immediately started bawling and just collapsed in her, uh, her lap, and yeah, then I got baptized by them, and it was just super freeing, so... Yes, it was awesome. We were so proud, and it was so powerful. <clears throat> and I just love how, don't you love how God, you know, orchestrates things and how how he uses people. He just speaks to us, you know. And I just, I was so excited because I was like, I kept wrestling. I was like, should I ask her if she needs to be baptized, if she's been baptized? And I'm like, okay. And I look at her, and she just burst crying. And I'm like, yes, that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> So, yeah, it was very exciting. But, um, yeah, so that's awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Yes. Woo so you've got some exciting news this morning. Do you yes. want to tell everybody your exciting yes. news? Yes. So Christian, our son, and his wife, Lauren, they had their baby. Yeah. So usually he's here running the sound. So this is the first week he hasn't been here. So, um, so yeah, they had her uh, Friday at 425 p.m. Her name is Amelia Blake Adams, named after her Uncle Blake. And, um, yeah, so we're excited. They're doing great. They came home last night, so 24 hours. So they, they did great. The baby's great. Mama's great. And we're happy. Yeah, and I am, I am G-Pops for the second time. And G Pop's uh, goal is to spoil the grandchildren, send them home, and then laugh. So that's what I do. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. If you're joining us by Facebook Live or by YouTube Live, we welcome you. Uh, we are live in North Beach, and we welcome you to come and join us any Sunday that you can. And uh, we're just having the Holy Spirit has just been falling every week here. And so we're excited to be here this morning. Let's just stand up. Let's uh, yes. welcome the manifest presence of God this morning. Jesus. You want to pray, Jen? Yes. Father, we just thank you for your presence in this house, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and lift up the name of Jesus. And we welcome you, Lord Jesus, into our midst. We just say, come and have your way in this service. Have your way in our lives. God, I pray that you would just minister minister to people's hearts today, Lord, that you would awaken people's hearts, God, and that you would just meet them exactly where they're at, Father. In Jesus' name, we love you, God. Amen. Let's Amen. worship Let's him. worship the Lord. that conquers all anxiety oh well let's try that one more time we haven't done that before but you know this is fun we're family here right <laughs> all right well they're playing this intro let's 
let's just stretch a little bit. Let's move. Put your hands up in the air. Maybe spin around in a circle. Spin in a circle. Just shake it off a little bit. We're going to wake up. We're going to have some fun this morning. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cries, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you, oh, let faith be a song that overcomes the raging sea, let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me, let it rise, let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cries, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. You, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cries, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, let's sing that again. Oh, oh, we praise you. Oh, yeah, let's clap our hands again. I want us to sing. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. Yeah, let's just have heaven invade this room this morning, invade the streets of the city with our praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Just welcome the Holy Spirit right now. You are worthy, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, in this place. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Lord. Just begin to lift him up with your voice this morning. You are worthy, Lord, of all our praise, all our adoration this morning, Jesus. This is what living, 
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. The all creation cries, God, we praise you. Oh, oh, oh. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. I met empty praise, treasures of fate are never enough. Come on, we all know that. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, tell them now. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Yes, we all know it's true. Let's tell them, I'm not afraid to show you my weaknesses, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountains. You're the God of the valley, yes. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Come on, sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I know it's true. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Jesus. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Who else feels like dancing in here? Yeah, Monica. Sing it with me. 
You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty to ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes shame into glory you're the only one who can turn the crane you turn crazy into goddess you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can
So here it is, my alabaster heart. I'm keeping nothing back from who you are. No hidden treasure veiled my key or lock. You're a lifetime worth of worship, and it's only just the start. So here it is, my every waking day. The minutes, hours, and years of endless praise. For you're worthy far beyond that I could say. There's a lifetime worth of worship and the nuance of your name. So let it rise. Like incense, my whole life, a fragrance every ounce, here broken at your feet. And every breath is an offering, my heart cries, these lungs sing over you. to you God so let it rise like incense my whole life a fragrance every ounce here broken at your feet and every breath is an offering my heart cries his lungs sing over you my worthy the King of kings and Lord of lords over everything. We give you all our worship. Oh, we give you all our attention. We give you all our affection this morning, Jesus. We're here for you. 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 soul and all I own you can have it all all my love all my love all my love you can have it all all my heart and all my soul and all I own you can have it all all my love all my love all my love you can have it all all my heart and all my soul God all I have it all, all my love, all my love, all my love. You can have it all, all my heart and all my soul, all I own. You can have it all. You're worthy of it all. So let it incense my whole life a fragrance every ounce here broken at your feet and every breath is my offering my heart cries these lungs sing over you my worthy king of kings so let it rise like incense whole life a fragrance every ounce here broken at your feet and every breath is my offering my heart cries these lungs sing over you my worthy 
everything It's all about you, Jesus Just give him your worship this morning Give him your worship this morning Look in those eyes of love, those eyes of fire Oh, you're so beautiful, Jesus There's none like you Oh, there's none like you In all of heaven, in all of earth There is none like you There is none like you There is none like you In all of heaven, in all of earth There is none like you There is none like you this morning all shame set aside all shame set aside we come before your throne with boldness this morning all shame set aside all shame set aside we're covered by the blood and it is more than enough you're covered by the blood and it is more than enough you're covered by the blood and it is more than enough just receive it this morning just receive it this morning we come before your throne with boldness we come before your throne boldness we come before your throne with boldness we come before your throne with boldness oh to worship oh to worship oh we're here to worship Jesus kings over everything in your own words lift him up this morning Let it rise like incense. 
fragrance my whole life, a fragrance every ounce, here broken at your feet. And every breath is an offering, my heart cries, these lungs sing over you. this morning. I just sense his presence here. And I felt that there was, uh, I'm really, I think I know, but there's a female here that you've been being drawn back to the Lord. You've uh, maybe have gotten hardened or turned away just a little bit. You've always loved the Lord, but you've just kind of not listened anymore to him. And the Holy Spirit is drawing you back to him. And he's just saying, surrender this morning, surrender this morning. And I, I really sense this morning God's going to do something in your life as you begin to surrender your heart to Him. So I want everybody to bow your head, close your eyes. If that's you, say, Clint, pray for me right where I'm at. Just lift your hand straight up high and pray, say, pray for me. Okay, I see your hand. Anybody else? Yeah, the one I thought. I see your hand. Jen, will you go pray for her? Just You can take money, take back to Sarah. The Lord wants to minister to you this morning. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you, Lord. We welcome you to change hearts and lives, Father. Lord, we thank you that you're ministering and touching, Lord. You're bringing uh, healing into lives, Father. In the name of Jesus, touch right now. There's one more right here. Leo and Linda, right here, Ryan with Ryan. If y'all would pray for her. Touch her heart right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. I just pray that this return to you would awaken and make her alive in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, that you receive those who return to you, Lord. 
Lord, that you would leave the 99 to go after the one, Father. And Lord, your eye has never been off of her, Father, but your eye has continually followed her and your presence has been after her the whole time, Lord. Lord, receive her offering this morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing this one more time, and then we're going to wrap this up. Yeah, I sing, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Come on, just lift your voice to heaven. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy. How many know the Lord rejoices when one returns to him? Come on, lift your voice and give him a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on. Worthy is your name, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. All right, we're just going to go right into our declaration, May. So let's stand. We sat, but we're going to stand. <clears throat> just seems... As we just sang that song, let it be a sweet, sweet sound that we have a God who declared creation into being. And so we're going to partner with him this morning as we typically do in our declaration. But I just thought, let's end worship declaring the goodness of God, heaven to earth in our city. So let's raise our voices together as we say, fixing our eyes on you, Lord, we live with your kingdom perspective, doing only what we see you doing. With you, nothing is impossible. So we partner with you for love encounters, dreams fulfilled, fractured hearts made whole, identities restored, families raised up, sons and daughters walking in their destinies, debts paid off, checks in the mail, arts and creativity ignited, complete healing, AIDS, cancer, and COVID-free zones, blessings and increase, favor and more favor as we bring heaven to earth and see jesus lifted high we will see san francisco living out its destiny as the city of our god birthing revival in the nations hallelujah all right so we're gonna we'll wrap up worship by by making our offering so if you would like you can give your offering in the back there's envelopes and a little box there, drop box, you can drop them in, or you can go online, and more simply, and be, most important, text to give. You can text 84321, and today, because we have Dr. Ed Savoso here as a guest, you can also text to give and contribute to his ministry by saying 84321, and then type special guest, and you can make guest speaker, guest speaker, all right? So, it is now a chance for our five-minute break, and kids, you're dismissed to the back corner, uh, up to upstairs. Take a break.
So good to have everybody here this morning. Oh, we got announcements. Go ahead, right here. <laughs> I was like, wait, am I still doing announcements? Yes. I am. We need to do announcements. All right, let's pop that first. Uh, you know, hoop earrings with masks is, when they have that little, like, slit in the back, is really annoying. Pulling it on and off. Awesome. I'll just start with the uh, welcome visitors. We are so glad to have. I see lots of new faces today. So let's just, yeah, let's clap for the new visitors. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have you guys here today. If you are new and interested in connecting um, with some of our team here at Revive, we would love to connect with you and get to know you. And the way that you can do that is we have connect cards in the back. Um, you'll see in the back of the room on the bar top, there's a couple little things over there. And so you can scan to do the connect card online, or you can fill one out and put it in the black box. Um, we're really excited to get to know you more, so please do that if you're new. Um, you will need uh, to register. Uh, it is actually the last Sunday in April, so um, we will put the registration out for May. Um, that will be soon, and you will be able to register for the entire month when we do that. We have good news online, so if you're new, you may not know that we actually record testimonies, which is awesome. So we want to collect testimonies. We want to be good stewards of the testimonies of God. There's some amazing stories on there. You can go to our good news page at Revive and read amazing testimonies. Just get uplifted, get encouraged. And if you have a testimony you'd like to share, we would love to hear your testimony, your story of God's goodness. You can go to that page and share uh, your story with us. We'd love to hear that. Um, we are also uh, would love you to join our launch team or our serving team. So if you're interested in being part of our Sunday service team, you can go on our website to reviveusf.com slash launch team, and you can let us know how you'd like to serve. We would love for you to be part of the Sunday morning team. Um, let's see, I lost my announcements here. Okay. We have midweek prayer on Wednesdays, um, headed up by Jen Adams. It's a super powerful time. Every Wednesday online, 1030 to 1130 AM, we share testimonies. We pray over the city, over the nation, over, uh, you know, politics, over anything you could think of. We share personal needs, and it's just such a really, really powerful and encouraging time to get together. So I encourage you, hop on, intercede, pray with us on Wednesdays, even if you just want to turn it on and just listen and just enjoy listening to the prayer time and sort of in your own home while you're cleaning your house or whatever you're doing or working. We'd love for you to hop on with us. Um, we have circle groups all throughout the week. Um, which is basically our form of small groups. So you can learn about those online as well at revivesf.com slash circle groups. And so go and uh, do some discovery and maybe message some of the leaders on there and connect. We'd love for you to join. Um, starting next week, we are starting our Revive Life One class called Your Best Life. It's going to be at 930 a.m., um, here at the building, it'll be upstairs in what's our kids' room currently. So if you would like to be a part, it's going to be a four-week series every Sunday starting next week at 9.30 a.m. Um, it's going to be headed up by Leo and Clint, and some of our leaders are going to be teaching, Armando. Um, it is just going to be a really awesome time. Some of the topics we go over is Revive as Family, Created for Significance, developing your significance and beginning to dream. So if you're new to Revive, we'd love to have you come and be part. You can register for that online. Um, we have a couple more here, so great job everyone hanging in with me. Uh, we have our coaching master class coming up May 8th at 9.30 a.m. and that's gonna be headed up by Leo. Um, we have our convocation of queens. That's headed by Ruth. Ruth, if you want to wave your hand, if you have any questions about that, you can talk to Ruth. It's going to be a powerful time, a seven-day um, gathering of women from around the world um, powerfully dominating their world, as said by Ruth. So if you would like to join online, it's going to be a really awesome time. You can learn more about that on our website as well. Um, next week is the first end of the Sunday of the month. 
And we're really excited. I know at our old building, we used to do brunch afterwards, and some people have been missing that sort of communal aspect. Um, and so what we're going to start doing is the first Sunday of every month, we're going to go to Washington Square Park across the street, and we're just going to hang out. You can bring a picnic lunch with you to church, or you can get some food locally and then come over and just hang out. And we're just going to hang out, have fun, maybe play some games and enjoy each other's company and be together. All right, and then uh, we've got two more here. The Sound Worship Conference is July 10th through the 11th with Chris Burns. It's going to be really, really awesome. Um, go online to learn more about that. We'll do some more announcements for that in the future, but you can actually register online already to save your spot. So I'd encourage you to go online and look more into that. Also on our website at revivasf.com slash events. All right, and last but not least, Chris and Callie, can you wave your hands up in the air? Woohoo! We love Chris and Callie. They're an amazing part of our body here at Revive, and they are leading our hiking group. So they're starting up after COVID. We had to shut that down, but they're doing it again for the first time next Saturday at 10 a.m. at Maury Point Trail. And so the information is on this slide. If you want to shoot a little picture of it, you can email Chris or you can just talk to him after service and he'll give you info. They also have a Facebook page for it. So um, here you go, Clint. Right. Wow. I just got tired listening to it. I was like, I'm worn out. I need to go take a nap. Uh, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm, we're so glad you're here this morning. Oh, I thought she was coming after me. <laughs> You never mess with a woman, right? So uh, we, we've got a special guest with us. Dr. Ed Silvoso is with us this morning, his wife, Ruth. And they have become very special to Jen and I. And I first got introduced to Dr. Ed with his first book in, when we were in Alabama, and uh, that none should perish. And he, my dad went to a conference in Texas and Dallas, and this is when... Things were happening, uh, I can't even remember what year it was, it's been so long. But anyway, he got the book, it was right when the book came out. What year was that, Dr. Ed? 94? So somewhere around 94, and we had just entered into revival. And our, we read this book, and we were like, that none should pay. Yeah, nobody needs to go to hell in our community. And so we started going door to door, neighborhood to neighborhood, sharing the gospel of Jesus. And we would see whole neighborhoods saved. And uh, we saw, and I've told you the testimony. We saw uh, three thousand people in our community give their heart to Jesus in five years. Three thousand people give their heart to Jesus in five years. <clears throat> this, the town, our little town, was uh, called Webb, and it had five hundred people in it, and that was it. Five hundred people in the whole city. That's a small city, right? The church ended up being about 600 to 700 big because it was bigger than the entire city on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And so God just began to move during that season. Uh, then we got hooked up with Bill Johnson. And, you know, Bill Johnson, Jen and I are in his apostolic fellowship, his apostolic group. And so uh, we meet with Bill every year with about 20 or 30 leaders around the world. And so we were in that group, and Bill always gives us gifts and, and gives us books that he thinks is and powerful and important. And he gave us Ed's book on the Ecclesia, and it was just one of the books in there. We had three books or something, but Bill said, I want you to read this book. This is the next move of God. This is what God's going to do. And so we begin, I come home and begin to read it, and uh, the term woke, I became woke. <laughs> I became woke to the kingdom and to the Ecclesia. And so, I mean, I just come alive. And then I was like, I'm going to email Ed Silvoso and just tell him, hey, can I meet with you? Because, I mean, all these things were going on in my heart and in my mind. And, uh, and I knew there had to be something different for the church. And I love the church. My dad a, was a pastor for many, many years. And, but I was more apostolic. And they would try to put me in the shoes of my dad, who was a pastor. And I, they just didn't fit. The shoes didn't fit. And so I never could make it work. And so, uh, so when uh, Bill gave us that book and I sent him the email, Ed uh, emails me back pretty quick. And we ended up going to a conference with him, and our hearts just got knitted. And I began to see God begin to give me the vision of us commissioning 500 ecclesias in San Francisco. Because renewal 
will transform the church right here in the salt shaker. But revival is when the community is transformed. And the only way the tr community is going to be transformed is if we send people out of this building, right? We can't be worried about just bringing people in, bringing people in for the sake of meeting. We've got to equip people to be the ecclesia, the church in our community. So I want you to stand up and give a hand for Dr. Ed Silvosa for being with us this morning. So glad you're here. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Good morning, folks. Let me put you at ease. There is nothing wrong with your hearing. It's my accent. <laughs> when you're born and raised in Argentina, like Ruth and I have been, and you learn English later in life, it comes out like this, very choppy and rusty. So what you do, you treat it like a difficult to catch radio broadcast. For you millennials, let me enlighten you. Radios used to have a dial, and you have to go <laughs> until you got it the best you could. And when you get there, don't move. Stay tuned. <laughs> if you like what I have to say, you will tell your friends this cool guy, you know, a Latino guy that sounded like Antonio Banderas was in <laughs> church today. If you don't like it, you will say this old guy who sounded like Henry Kissinger <laughs> tried to say something. But the bottom line, folks, we are delighted to be here. I mean, we have met Pastor Clint and Pastor Jen, and uh, we have come to love them and appreciate them. They are all in people. They go for it or they don't go for it. And God kidnapped them from Alabama, you know, and brought them here. They are a gift to you, to me, to the Bay Area. And I'll share in a moment a word that I received about San Francisco and about this congregation and about you. You see, we are usually very eager to receive a word for the city, a word for the church. But none of that amounts to much unless it becomes a word for you, because you are the ecclesia, you are the church. Without God, we can't, but without us, he won't. But before we do that, I would like to have a prayer with you. I'm going to invite my best friend, my personal intercessor, my wife, we celebrated 53 years of marriage. You know, this is Ruth. I love her dearly. Uh, God has given us four daughters who are happily married. They cooperate with their husbands, and they gave us 12 grandkids. The youngest one is eight. She thinks she's 20. <laughs> you will see now that you're getting grandkids. The oldest one is 27. They are all on fire for God. They love God. We had a ball the other day. We were celebrating Ruth's birthday also. And just to hear the kids look to the future with hope, you know, and believing that they can change the world. So we would like to pray that whatever problems you came to this meeting with, the Lord will intervene right now. Not an hour from now, not half an hour, right now. God is a God of now and here. We're going to pray, and we're going to take authority. If you say, but Ed, I don't have the faith. I don't have the anointing. Don't worry. We have it. Okay? You don't come to San Francisco to preach unless you get the anointing, right? And you get to help people. But we are a body. Look around. I mean, look at all the young people. I was so touched to see all these young folks, you know, on fire for the Lord. So would you stand up where you are, and, uh, and would you repeat this prayer with us? We're going to take authority over all power of the evil one. As you take authority, people will, get, will be set free. And we are going to take authority seriously. So I want you to repeat after us. And don't be like an anemic, bulimic, effeminate policeman. Say, oh, Mr. Devil, could you back off, please? No. Roll like a lion. Yeah. Take authority. Yeah. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That is the word. The God of peace will do that. So would you do this? You know, repeat after that. Father God, Father God. let it be known. In heaven and on earth, and even under the earth, 
that today, here now, we, your people, are gathered in the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ. We take refuge in you, and we oppose the devil, and every demonic force that has come against us, our family, our jobs, our cities. In Jesus' name, we say, Satan, be gone. We are free. We are greater than any evil power. Father God, bless the person on my right. Bless the one on my left. Touch them. Bless them. Heal them. <clears throat> Deliver them. Set them free. Let your kingdom come. And we say to San Francisco, and we say to the Bay Area, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. In the name of Jesus, get up and run. In the name of Jesus, San Francisco, you are God's San Francisco. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now give a big hand to the Lord. And before you take your seat, remember when Paul was bitten by that demonized snake that refused to leave his hand. I mean, the snakes usually, they bite you and they flee. But that one was so demonized, in my understanding, that it stayed there. What did he do with it? He shook it. So I want you to shake it off. Whatever problem you came up, shake it off right now. Say, in the name of Jesus, I am free. I am free. Tell the one next to you, you are free. Prophesy over him, you are free. <laughs> Amen. And now before you sit down, look at somebody in the eye and tell that person, I love you and there is nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Folks, uh, what I would like to share with you, Ruth and I, as well as Dave and Sue Thompson who are here, I'm sure Jill and Eric and others on our team, but Ruth and I, every time we drive through San Francisco, we lower our windows and we bless the city. And we say, you are blessed of the Lord, you know? Um, and I want to show you a very, very short video clip of something we did about 21 years ago here in San Francisco. And when I woke up this morning, actually in my sleep, the Lord was reminding me that his word will never return void. And about 21 years ago, there was a word that was released over San Francisco. And I believe that the advent of Pastor Clint and Pastor Jen and their relocation to this congregation that has a very illustrious history of caring for the city. You know, Michael Brodeo and other leaders that were here, they were architects of unity and transformation. That is about to happen again. And basically, the word is this. God is about to move mightily in the Bay Area. But San Francisco is the point of inception. God will shake San Francisco for good. And let me give you the background for this video clip. Our ministry, now it's called Transform Our World, was celebrating 20 years. And we said, you know, being in revival and gatherings and all that, we said we need to look for a place where the whole Bay Area can come together. And we were avoiding San Francisco for a number of reasons, some Misinformed prophets were sending it to the bottom of the ocean, you know. And then some feisty evangelists came and sent everybody to hell unless they repented. And they pointed to all the sins of the city, which are not few. And uh, so we were staying away from it. But our intercessors, you know, people that pray like you do on Wednesday, they listen to God. And the Lord sent a message to Ruth and I, say, you have to do it in San Francisco. And they said, but Lord, look at, you know, look at everything that is wrong with the city. 
And then the Lord reminded us that every city has a redemptive gift. You know, God has given a gift to that city to be a blessing, not only to the people there, but to the greater area. And the redemptive gift of San Francisco is mercy. You see, it's named after San Francis of Assisi, you know, who was very compassionate. He cared for the poor and the needy. I mean, the Golden Gate, you know, was the entrance to the California area, you know, the the missions that were established, not without some setbacks, you know. They were, so this was a city that was always serving other areas there. And then the Lord said, when a city has a redemptive gift of mercy, and the church is behind four walls and is absent in the public square, that city will naturally attract people that need mercy. And the church is not there. So if there is a problem with garbage, don't blame the rats. It's your garbage. Get rid of the garbage. Get rid of your prejudice, and God will move. So when we understood that, we repented, and then we did something that I sense Pastor Clean, I mean, in an adapted version, God will want to do. There are nine counties in the Bay Area. You know, the U.S. runs on two rails. One is New York, and the other one is California. New York is the financial capital. California is the innovation, creativity, and entertainment capital of America. And so there are nine counties here. San Francisco, as you know, is a city county. And so we went to the other eight counties. We talked to the pastors and the intercessors. We explained what we have been doing wrong. We said we need to repent. We need to bless the city. And then we drove to the city, met with the pastors that were overwhelmed, got on our knees, asked their forgiveness. They forgave us. And together we asked God, God, would you bless San Francisco? And then we were in prayer asking, how can we do it? And Pastor Clint made reference to my book, That None Should Perish, which is a companion book to prayer evangelists of Luke chapter 10. And, uh, and then we divided the city into eight vectors, and each county adopted one-eighth of the city. And then those pastors organized their congregations, and on, on weekends they will drive by and bless the city, you know, in that particular sector, so that we really marinated the city with prayer. And then one day, we organized an air, land, and sea expedition. We have intercessors on airplanes flying all over the Bay Area, pouring oil from very on high. So the Bay Area is God's Bay Area. We have caravans of cars taking off from San Jose, and one coming on 101, the other on 880, and converging and blessing every city. And then about 300 of us were on a cruise on the bay, you know, blessing. It was an incredible day. And prior to that, a leader from the city came to me and said, you have to invite the mayor. The mayor was Willie Brown Jr., no Sunday school teacher, you know, by any records. I mean, and he said, well, uh, Go ahead and invite him. Come to this gathering we were having at one of the convention halls here. And the mayor sent word back to me, say, I will go on one condition. It has to be a very secular uh, ceremony. I don't want anything religious there. Because prior to that, the very feisty evangelist came and sent the city to hell and treat, mistreated the people. It was real, real bad. And so that day, we began with air, land, and sea. Then we went to Union Square. We set up prayer stations there. We helped the people. We fed the, the hungry and so forth. But we needed to get the mayor to come to that meeting. So I told the emissary, tell him that I will do everything possible to keep it secular. And he took that in good faith. So he told the mayor, yep, you can come. It will be secular. Now, how do you keep one or 2,000 intercessors and prophetic people secular, you know? But by then, the Spirit of God was moving. We were at this uh, convention place, and I said, listen, in a moment, the mayor will come. 
I promise him this will be a secular thing. So no hallelujah, no praise the Lord, no one bells it on the aisle. Think of this as a PTA meeting, okay? Be very secular because I promise him that. And then when they gave me word that the mayor was coming, prior to that, the Lord told me, the week before, the night before, we went to the Castro district and we cleaned it up because some very misinformed people have gone and abused them and thrown garbage all over the place. And then we took an offering that came up to $65,000 to give to the mayor to help the victims of AIDS. I'm talking 21 years ago, and that was a major, major problem. So the mayor is coming, so okay, everybody, no hallelujahs, no praise the Lord. <laughs> so he walks in, and I asked Dick Bernal, who used to pastor Jubilee Christian Center, and she's the one that brought that feisty evangelist, and they messed it up. <laughs> I said, Dick, you have to ask forgiveness. And, uh, and so the mayor came, we were very secular, so I want you to watch. I kept my half of the bargain until the mayor took the microphone. <laughs> And the anointing was so powerful. And I want you to pay attention to two things because that's the genesis for the word. What he declared prophetically and what he prayed with us at the end. And, and when you watch that, say, that's for me. That's for now. That's where we're going to go. So let's play this video clip and then I'll come back. In our passion and in our zeal for God and for this beautiful city, I'm a fifth generation Burnell. Our people have been in this area 200 years. Uh, we have come to this city full of zeal, but maybe not wisdom. And uh, this building brings back memories. And we have caused the city some problems because we didn't come in with an olive branch to certain groups and say, we're only here to bless, not to curse. We're only here to love and not to bring problems. So on behalf of the clergy and the ministers of the South Bay and San Francisco, uh, please forgive us for causing problems in the past. And I make a vow today, and I believe all my brothers can say amen, that we will never come back to this city unless we love it and bless it in the name of a God who amen. does. Amen. amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Dick. It's a mayor we brought from the South Bay a small gift that we hope will be the beginning of many gifts. We brought $20,000, but these people says, no way, Jose. You're not going to give a gift to a city alone. And they added $45,000. So it is my honor to present to you a gift for the city for $65,000 to help the victims of AIDS. God bless you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I am delighted to receive this, but let me tell you, while this check will be of great value, what you've done with your prayers on behalf of our city is of greater value. And for that, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. And when you pause and you come to spend time with us on behalf of the city, I can tell you we can see some immediate benefits. Because when I started out this morning, it was a dreary, awful looking day. And I wondered by noon when I showed up at the gardens for the children's movement, suddenly the sun was out. And it was bright and people were, people were having fun. People were enjoying the weather. And I recognized right off that something unusual had occurred. And knowing my fellow San Franciscans, I know it was not their connection. Now I know what happened. Now I know what happened. Now all of you visitors. With your collective voices, 
reached out to the heavens offering comfort to our souls we welcome you I wish you come back every week <laughs> and not just because you gave me forty five thousand dollars but I'd wish you come back as often as you possibly can the seven hundred and eighty thousand San Franciscans need you the seven hundred and eighty thousand San Franciscans welcome you we look forward to interacting with you and believe me Amos and Willie represents San Francisco not whomever those other people are and now we say Father God bless San Francisco let a revival of mercy and joy come a revival of prosperity a revival of the kingdom of God in the name of our Lord Amen in our passion and in our zeal. Can somebody shout hallelujah, you know? <laughs> now, folks, that word has been here all this time. And God has been waiting for a place to land. In fact, after that event, the mayor called us, and he says, I would like to give you $4 million and donate one of our buildings for you to take care of the homeless and the poor. And we say, why would you do that? For two reasons. If I do it, the bureaucracy will eat up 90% of every penny. And number two, I like the way you do things. Unfortunately, we didn't have the understanding we have today about the ecclesia. We didn't have an understanding of the prophetic. We were very pastoral, which is very good. But they would say, yeah, but if we take money from Caesar, are we not violating this principle? And what if we have to hire non-believers and so forth? And unfortunately, we declined that. But the mayor invited us to City Hall and gave us a commendation, which is on the record about that day that happened many, many years ago. So folks, I'm here to declare that the Lord is about to move mightily. I have a PowerPoint I want to use whenever it's ready just to show you that God wants to do it and God will do it. The only question is, are you gonna be on that bus when God takes off? Now, you may say, well, Ed, you are Latino, you know, you are emotional, you know, we are Americans, Anglo-Saxons, you know, you guys put Tabasco sauce in your coffee and then you believe anything. You know, we are more cerebral. Is it ready to go? Thank you. Thank you. But let me tell you a little bit about my own story. I came to the Lord as a teenager. I was the first and I remained the only born-again high schooler in a city of 120,000. It was very, very lonely. But my pastor believed in transformation. And he said, one day you will reach a city for Christ. Only by faith you can believe that when you are the only born again high schooler in a city of 120,000. But I believe that. And Ruth and I, who have been in courtship for seven years, you know, we began in our teens. One day we were at the camp and this missionary couple looked at us and told us, one day you will reach a city for Christ. The first city we reached for Christ was not our hometown, it was Resistencia, which is the subject of that book. This is a city of 400,000 people. Dave and Sue Thompson were there with us. Only 5,143 believers. That's a little bit over 1%. But we received a word that God was about to move in that city. And we went there with faith. And we learned prayer evangelism. And everybody seems to hate that city. It was so perverted in so many ways. But the Lord says, look beyond the sin. Look to the sinner. Love the sinner. We prayer walked the city. <clears throat> we established 
houses of prayer that now we call ecclesias. Everybody began to pastor the neighborhood. 547 of those were established. And then a cascade of conversions began to happen. And today, in that city and region, is the most evangelical region in Argentina. A quarter of a million people are saved. And they walk to Jesus. Why? Why not? Why not? You see, there is a mystery where an almighty God who can snap his fingers and make things happen chooses not to make them happen until somebody on earth agrees with him. And I'm here to tell you, you are the one that God is looking for. But what has become more clear recently is our understanding that we are the church. We are the ecclesia. You know, we go to an ecclesia meeting like this. But when this meeting is over, you remain the church. And when two of you gather together, and who doesn't have another person that you walk with, then you have the manifest presence of Jesus there. And signs and miracles and wonders begin to happen. We also understand now the apostolic foundation. Unfortunately, that is a word that has been abused. And usually we think of apostles of overweight peacocks perch on top of everybody else, telling everybody, come on, tie to me and do what I do. But actually, an apostle is a father. He's somebody who lays down a foundation, whose life is reflected in our own lives because they leave the imprint of Christ. They are fathers. They are mothers because they are willing to lay down their lives for us. And that establishes the bonding. And then we understand that the church is not an organization. It's a family. We love each other. We cannot walk away from a family. And now... But we heard the story of Pastor Clean and Pastor Jennifer that God takes them out of Alabama and brings them to San Francisco with a hunger and a thirst to really, really see something happen here. We said, Lord, we are ready. We are ready. And we are already walking in covenant with Bill Johnson. You know, he will take the northern part. And Cheyenne is taking the southern part. And we are here in the middle. And we say, folks, come on. Let San Francisco rock, you know. How it will play, I don't know. But it will be fun. But, we need, but, but that's why, let me tell you what is going on all over the Bay Area. There are over 3,000 believers, you know, in the taking industry here who believe in God, who pray, who take the presence and the power of God to those places. There are thousands of believers in schools and teachers, but they need that apostolic voice. They need that apostolic foundation. And when Ruth and I pulled into the city and we began to bless, we sensed that San Francisco was smiling and saying, hey, my day is coming, and you are the answer, even if you don't live in the city, but your heart is in the city, like Ruth and I have our heart in the city. God will do it. But on top of that, Pastor Clint and Pastor Jennifer come from Alabama. You say, well, what does that have to do? Well, we held our conference in Alabama. They were there last October. We are doing it again. And in Alabama, there is another pastor who understood the ecclesia, understood the apostolic, put his entire leadership through the accelerator, which is our training program. They began to practice. And today, in all 67 counties in Alabama, there is an ecclesia in government. And the chief justice of the Supreme Court, the lieutenant governor, and the, and the attorney general, Believers, they pray every week, taking the presence and the power of God to Alabama. And there are 12 leaders that are apostolic. We just finished training them. And they are dedicating their entire congregation. And they are beginning to take the presence and the power of God all over the place. And so when the Lord 
took prisoners because that were in apostle days. You are a prisoner of Christ. Clint and Jen and brought them here. They bring that heritage. They come from a state that is being rocked with the message of transformation. Now you may say, but Pastor Ed, but how do we deal with what is going on? Well, let me put it in perspective. Today we live on an evil day. No question about that. I'm an optimist, but I don't chew on broken glass. I recognize reality. It's a difficult day. But look at that verse. Would you read it with me at the count of three? One, two, three. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind in order to stand fair in the evil day. That's a command from God. What is the evil day? The evil day is when rulers of a spiritual darkness co-opt government and circles of power. And the evil that has been in the heavenly places is institutionalized in those circles of power through legislation. That's where we are today. And this has nothing to do with Democrats and Republicans, you know. This has to do with the Babylonian system that rules there. It has to do with social media. It has to do with the educational system. An evil day has happened through history when things collage like, you know, coalesce like that. Let me give you some examples. It happened in the garden when Jesus told his disciples, his most trusted disciples, I will not talk any longer because the prince of darkness is coming. And he took over the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body. And then he took over, you know, Pontius of Pilatus. And they took authority and crucified Jesus. So, yes, it happened. But what followed that? Pentecost. Now, it happened in Judea, okay, when the churches were beaming and bursting and growing. And Saul of Tarsus got legal authority to persecute, imprison, and kill Christians. It was a region-wide massive persecution and execution of Christians. It happened before. But through that persecution, people fled, and Antioch was opened, and the gospel reached people like you and I. It happened in Asia Minor. You know, every time Paul went to a city and presented the gospel, and there were conversions, they were thrown in jail, they were persecuted, they were left for dead. But out of that came Philippi and Corinth and Ephesus. I mean, Thessalonica. I mean, the region of Galatia. These are, these are books in the Bible that we study how to evangelize, how to be a Christian. The devil made the move with the evil day because the rulers and authority co-opted the political powers, but God used that for good. And then it happened in Rome when Nero went on a rampage. And you may have read in history, Christians were tarred and set on fire. And he lit Rome with burning Christians and threw them to the lions. But out of the blood of those saints came revival. And there was a revival that rocked Rome and rocked the Roman Empire like nothing else. Tremendous. And then it happened when the Holy Roman Empire <laughs> took over the Holy Roman Church, no reflection on the Catholic Church today, I'm talking dark ages, and through the Inquisition, they have these tribunals that put people to death, burn them, and so forth. But what was the counter move of God? The Reformation, the printing of the Bible, the invention of the Gutenberg Press, I mean, the fact that now the Bible is no longer in papyrus, in, in convents, you know, that, that monks, yeah, people were printing the Bible. Social media is the equivalent of the Gutenberg Press. When people say, hey, let's flee social media because it's evil, don't. Go into social media. Take the presence and the power of God there. But we didn't stop there. World War II, Hitler, 
I mean, institutionalized evil. The Japanese imperialists did the same thing. It was a massive carnage. Millions of people were killed. But out of that came the most massive, powerful missionary movement ever to happen because so many of those soldiers, when they came back, they have tasted life overseas. Billy Graham was rocking America with revival. Multitudes were coming to Christ. And out of that came the missionary movement. Ruth and I are believers today because of that missionary movement. So you see how there is a move and a counter move. And this takes us to 20. 21, where we do have an evil day, where we do have, you know, an erasing of identities and so forth. But my friends, learn from the scriptures and learn from history. There are two moves that God allows. First, he lets his people come together to be strengthened. And when they reach an ideal point, he uses a crisis or some unusual, unpleasant circumstances. He gathers and he scatters them. And they always grow. Let me give you examples. Jesus says, I'm going to heaven, tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. They were in the upper room. What were they doing? Reading the Bible. At the Old Testament at the moment, right? Praying, fellowshipping, until they reach the boiling point. And what did God do? He frightened them with the noise of a mighty wind. In this sense, there was a wind. It was the noise of a mighty wind because he wanted to get them out of the building where they were having the best Bible studies you can imagine. He wanted to get them on the street so that the Holy Spirit will baptize them, not inside the building, but on the street for the ecclesia to be born on the street and not inside four walls. And that was dramatic because now they find themselves looking like drunkards there and bubbling and preaching. And 3,000 heads of household came to Christ. He gathered them and he scattered them. Now they go to the temple to do what? To pray, to fellowship, to be strengthened. And God causes them to heal a paralytic. The paralytic gets healed. And what happens? They throw them in jail. They threaten them. They say, don't you dare do that. They beat them up, right? And they came and they say, hey, folks, let's pray, not for this to go away. Let's pray for courage to preach a message that God will confirm with signs and wonders. And now they shifted from the temple courts that were only good for Jewish to Solomon's portico. Why was that important? Because Solomon's portico was as close as Gentiles could come. And now in Acts chapter 6, you see the apostles doing publicly what they were doing privately before because God used a crisis and a persecution to get them out of the four, building, four walls. And now the churches are growing and brimming and expanding all over Judea. And Saul of Tarsus gets those letters and persecute them. And they are scattered all over. And prior to that, they were very, very Jewish in their tradition. Believers have to be circumcised. You have to join like a synagogue. But the group of them went to Antioch, which is a merchant city, not a religious city. And they preached the gospel with such an anointed that Gentiles get saved. And they don't have the temple there. They don't have the priest. So these guys get saved. They eat pork. They don't wash their hands. They don't keep the tradition. They break every rule that they were raised with. Don't do this. Don't do that. And so the executive committee decides to send an inspector. And I'm glad that James maybe caught the flu that day because James flunked public relations in college. <laughs> and they sent Barnabas, that is his son of consolation. And he said that Barnabas saw the grace of God. And he said, hey, they don't look like Jews. They don't walk like Jews. They don't behave like Jews. But they are believers. And right there through a shock, she says, hmm, maybe we are doing church the wrong way. 
And rather than go back to Jerusalem, goes and looks for Paul that has been encouraged to go away because he was upset in the status quo. And for two years, they taught these desperados. <laughs> and they did such a great job. He gathered them that believers were called Christians for the first time in Antioch. And now that they reached that optimal point that people say those are followers of Christ. Antioch is being transformed. The prophets and teachers were ministering to God and said, release them. And they are released to go out. That was traumatic. They were having an incredible revival, like, like your town there. I mean, they have more people in church than maybe people in the city. But God says, go there. And they go through persecution and stoning and being thrown in jail. But out of that comes a series of revivals all over Asia Minor. And now we get to Acts chapter 19. And I believe that there is a correlation between Acts 19 and COVID-19. Why do I say that? Because in Acts 19 is the last time that Paul tried to plant a church inside a synagogue. He tried that for three months and couldn't get too far. So eventually he leaves the religious setting, goes into the marketplace, into a school building, and now rather than preaching once a week to God-fearing people in a religious building, now he's ministry every day to non-believers in the secular setting because he has a tent-making operation. And he does it with such an anointing, and this is the anointing for you today, that his perspiration carried the anointing and impregnated his robes. And his robes and handkerchief are taken, and people that are oppressed by demons are set free. And people that are sick are being healed. You don't learn that in seminary. You let expository preaching and exegesis and hermeneutics, which is all good. But in two years, all of Asia, that's the Roman province of Asia, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. My friends, God allowed COVID. He did an engineer. It's just our human nature that causes that to teach us a lesson that you are the church, and that greater is he who is in you <clears throat> than the one who is in the world. And that wherever you go, <clears throat> you take the power and the presence of God all over the place. And I declare, this is the moment that if you go for it, God will anoint your secular, wrong term, but I'm gonna use it so you catch it, job, in such a way that whether you are coding or you are writing or you are teaching or you are cooking under the anointing as Ruth teaches, it will be a reenactment of Paul's making tense. There will be so much anointing flowing out of you that everything that touches you and you touch will touch other people. And we will see San Francisco totally transformed. You see, the command is be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. These are two different moves, but they are complementary. To be strong in the Lord is internal. It's to be strong inside of you. To be strong in the power of his might is to attack the powers of darkness that are out there. You see, there is a parallel between the Ecclesia in Ephesus, Acts 19, and POW, Transform Our World or Revive Church, and the Ecclesia in your sphere of influence. In Acts 19, Paul left the religious setting as the only venue where he was preaching to take it to a secular venue. And in two years, everybody heard the word of God. How many people is estimated live in Asia, the Roman province. You know how many? 1,200,000 people. How many heard the word of the Lord? 
1,200,000. Why? Because God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. What miracles was God performing? He was using what Paul was doing in the marketplace. He was using what people were doing at home. Pastor Clint made reference, the manifest presence of Jesus. I mean, our home, like your home, is an ecclesia. Jesus is all over the place. During COVID, we cannot entertain people, but God allows the washing machine to break down or the garbage disposal or the refrigerator, and we have to bring repairmen. And when they come, they feel something. And without us, except in one case, bringing up the subject of Christianity, they ask, what is going on here? It's the manifest presence of Jesus. Oh, listen to the Holy Spirit. It's an evil day. It's true. But God is gathering his church, making it stronger because he's ready to scatter us beyond where we are. You see, in Acts 19, the ecclesia debunked the Babylonian system. Remember, they were worshiping Artemis. They have this industry of temples. They were totally demonized. But when Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, that has already happened. And the devil is orchestrating a counterattack against the ecclesia. He's coming against that. And he says, put on the full armor of God, not just the armor, but the full armor of God, that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the evil one. Twice, the full armor of God is commanded to be worn in Ephesians. The first time is to fight against systemic evil in the marketplace, See, against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. Look, the word in the Greek for principalities is arche, from where we get architect. The word for powers is esousia, from where we get authorities. Here you have architects of evil with authority. The word for rulers is cosmocrator, which is those in authority. And you put those three together, and you have a spiritual evil forces all over the place. So, folks, Paul told the friend, the Ephesians, put on the full armor of God because we are going to debunk that. And in chapter 2, he said, we're going to deal with the racial issue. Isn't that a hot issue today? We're going to deal with it. In chapter 3, the churches will come together. The saints will express the fullness of God. In chapter 4, the ministers, pastors, and, and, and evangelists, and teachers, and prophets, they will be diligent in maintaining the unity of the spirit. In chapter 5, husbands and wife, God is putting down an extraordinary anointing for greater intimacy in our families. If you are married, with your spouse. If your spouse is not a believer, he or she will come to the Lord with your children. I mean, that is the will of God. I mean, Ruth and I uh, courted for seven years, and we wrote over 2,000 love letters, you know, in those seven years. For you millennials, there were no internet many years ago, and, uh, and you have to trust that the postman will deliver the letter. And she was teaching in an elite uh, British school, and I prayed that the postman would be an old guy with crooked teeth and no hair, you know, because she was always waiting for him to come, and I didn't want, you know, the guy to get the wrong message. But we wrote over 2,000 letters, and as we are reading those letters, so often we are weeping and crying and saying, Lord, Revive us again. Give us that passion. I mean, here she was teaching in elite British school. I was running the hospital, and I sat on the board of a bank, and I have an investment company. I was only 22 years old. And we are so eager to give it up, to plant a church in an Indian reservation that was starving to death. Of course, God took us in a different direction. 
but he wants to revive that. And time and again, Ruth and I are rediscovering the sweetness of intimacy in marriage. The sweetness. Why is dating so exciting? Because you are looking forward to something else. And then when you get married, we park it there, we begin to look backwards, and then we hit the wall. But listen, it's free, it's available, it's right there, it's legit, enjoy it. Have a honeymoon every day, every month, every year. Because that is the best recipe to restore marriages, biblically speaking, for people to see that we enjoy having intimacy with each other. And parents and children coming together. And then masters and slaves, have and have nots. And then and only then you tackle the principalities and powers. So folks, look at the armor of God. And I'll conclude with this before we pray in impartation. He said, put the belt of truth. That what you wore the day you learned the truth. That you are a sinner, but Jesus died for you. Then you put the breastplate of righteousness. That was the day you were saved. Then you put the sandals of peace to take peace to others. That's prayer evangelism. Bless, fellowship, minister to them. Declare the kingdom of God. Then she says the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then the helmet of salvation, that's proclamation. And then the sword of the spirit. And because the Roman soldier didn't have a radio, she couldn't say in the radio, and the radio is key. I was in a commando company in the army, and that is key. You have to have communication with your commanding officer. So he couldn't say the radio, so he said, praying always, turn it on, in the spirit, on all occasions, all channels, all perseveres, do you hear me, do you hear me, with all the saints, be in constant communication. And when you have that armor of God, and this is the main point, the fight it does, the devil is fighting against us today, show that he's not inside, but outside our perimeter. You only use fighting darts when you are attacking a position that is well entrenched. And those fighting darts are only good if they land on combustible material. Otherwise, they are useless. And that's why there is such a revival of holiness in the church. That's why people are being reconciled. That's why Ruth and I, I mean, we live in holiness. But I'll tell you, holiness is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Every time you drive through, they are painting it. Because you get to the end, it begins to rust at the beginning, you know. God is giving this revival of holiness to the church and to you and I. Because, my friends, I wish when I was your age, your youth, I could have heard that God wants me to change a nation. It took me many years to learn that. The devil wants us to believe that he took over America. He hasn't taken over America. He took over social media, granted. He took over the educational system. He took over certain areas in government. But the reason is that we haven't been there. And that's why we need to prepare for a counterattack. And we shouldn't go after the archers. The archers are out there. I mean, when Christians get angry, let's get rid of Hollywood, let's get rid of social media, let's get rid of government, let's get rid of this political party. They are the ones fighting the arrows. But look what has happened in the Bay Area since 2002. I sit on the board of Bali Christian Schools. Bali Christian School is considered by many, the number one school in America, Christian or secular. We have put over a thousand experiments on the International Space Station. I mean, we have won the X Prize for underwater exploration. We beat big, big corporations. But this school was dedicated to God as an ecclesia. Our campus is a dream, a $150 million campus. But God spoke to the leadership and told us, 
My justice is not justice until it becomes social justice. You cannot have this Christian ghetto here and the public school is broke. So then the leadership picked the poorest school in the McKinley Public School District, went to see the principal, say, what can we do for you? They say, oh, you can do a lot, but I don't think you will be able to. Why? Because you are Christians and we are public school. And our leadership told them, don't worry, we will do it and we will not mention God. But to ourselves, we say, we will bring God. And then every week, a vast load of our seniors, properly trained in prayer evangelism, taught everything they couldn't afford, built computer labs, marching bands, you name it. In two years, that school that was on probation became number one in the district. The principal and his wife got saved, and their two children got saved. Bible clubs began to spring up. Now the superintendent of the district came to see Dr. Doherty, who is the CEO of Valley. said, what's the secret? I want all my schools to do this well. And I tell people, show them Rachel, but they sneak Leah into the bedroom. <laughs> because you see, Jacob wanted the wife, God wanted the nation. And that's what Leah gave Jacob, more kids. Than, so he said, well, look at our campus. It's excellent. All over, look at our football stadium, look at the Olympic size swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, I see it, I see it. Okay, what's the other side? God, oh shoot, he said, he almost cast. We cannot go there. <laughs> but we said, listen, what is your biggest problem? And a couple that are part of this fellowship we have every Wednesday with Pastor Clint and Pastor Jen, Sonny Lara and his wife Linda, launch a program called The Firehouse. And this is a program that the student to be admitted has to have four F. If you have three, you are not bad enough. Go get the fourth one and then come. These are the people that the school doesn't know what to do with them. And they feed them, they treat them with respect, with honor. And now for five years in a row, everybody there has graduated with good grades, many of them with A+, plus, and scholarships to universities that opened the door in the public school system before Kobe for us to have clubs and proclamation. And before Kobe hit, are you ready for this? 4,300 students and many teachers have received the Lord in the public school system. And many of them have been baptized in the public school swimming pool with the blessing and the announcement of the district. Why? Why not? Because we strengthened our position. We went there not with religion. We went there with the kingdom of God. I mean, when Major Willie Brown offered $4 million in the building, he was saying without saying, I want the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Goodness, peace, and joy. That's what it is. Those students at Valley Christian and the leadership, they love San Francisco. Even when God leads, they want to converge here. Not too far across the way, and I close with this example, is Vallejo, a city that declared bankruptcy. And there was a fellow, Michael Brown, with the bus transportation company for students, a million passengers a year. He heard the message and realized, I am not the owner of a company, I am a minister. He opened the doors of the ballroom, dedicated the ballroom to the Lord, invited Jesus to be the CEO, the Father to be the chairman of the board, the Holy Spirit to be the legal counsel. And his company began to prosper and prosper and prosper. They adopted the schools. They provided what the district couldn't give to them. An incredible change happened. His company prospered so much that his volume grew from $2 million to $21 million. And then he realized there is injustice in the marketplace. Why will I be so rich and my employees are so poor? So he sold the company to his employees. And the company continued to grow. And now they decided in Solano County to offer to adopt everybody released from prison 
who most likely will be back in prison within three years to be trained as professional bus drivers. The authority says, no, you don't know what you're asking. These are criminals. They have no social skills. Say, give us a shot. Say, I'll give you the 10 worst cases. If you succeed with one, come back. All 10 graduated. All 10 found the job. None of them went back. This is the seventh year that everybody released across from the water here to this company doesn't go back to prison because the company became an ecclesia. Oh, my friends, San Francisco is the key. San Francisco is a city with a destiny. San Francisco is a city with a prophetic anointing. And you are here. And that's why we are here to tell you, we are totally committed to see this happen. And when we met Pastor Clint and Pastor Jen, and through them we met some of you, and as we walk into this place today, and when I saw the young people and the worship and the announcement and everything, folks, God is smiling on you. But you have to go for a little bit more. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, they said, oh, you will restore the kingdom to us. No, no, that's the beginning, Jerusalem. But then you go to Judea, and then you go to Samaria, and you keep going. So listen to the Holy Spirit and answer this question. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Just answer that question. Listen to what God wants you to do. He wants you to change San Francisco as a starting point. I mean, when those missionaries look at Ruth and I, we were teenagers and told us, you will reach a city. I have nothing to hang that on except faith. And I grab it. And we did it. We have over 300 cities that are being transformed. Paul Chomburguia, who is one of uh, the equivalent of Pastor Clint in Ciudad Juarez, he was running for mayor. Now he's given $600 million to rebuild Ciudad Juarez because of the transformation message that he brought there. We are going next week to Nashville where somebody has a company that is about to hit $1 billion in sales and they want to use that to transform an industry. Folks, we are the ecclesia. You are the ecclesia. So I'm here to tell you, San Francisco shall be transformed. Because Pastor Clint and Pastor Jennifer believe it, and they said yes to the Lord. And we are here to acknowledge that they are a gift from God to the city, to you, to our movement. An apostle is a prisoner. He's somebody that God took captive and gave them. In the old days, people would conquer a territory and build a statue of themselves to remind the people, you serve somebody that looks like him. Jesus didn't build the statues. He takes people and gives them. And apostles are not ordained by any man. God ordains them as apostles. What is an apostle? It's somebody who lays down the foundation for others to build on it. And those folks become his or her living epistles. When people see them, they say they look like Clint. They look like Jennifer. They talk like them. They teach like them. An apostle is somebody that believes that those that he or she is leading will do greater works than them. An apostle is like sunshine. The sun shines on bare ground, and what is buried there begins to germinate. You know you are in the presence of an apostle because when he or she is nearby, your dreams begin to percolate in you. As I see some of you, I've seen those dreams to percolate. So, folks, I would like to have a moment and pray for Pastor Clean and Pastor Jennifer, recognizing 
on behalf of so many leaders that are eager and willing to come to San Francisco where you are ready to strike as apostles that God has set aside. But that will not go too far unless you say yes to the Lord for your part. Is the Lord speaking to you? You see, the first step will not get you to the destination, but will get you going. But Ruth and I received that word. We said, yes, like Abraham, we didn't know how to get there, but I know I didn't want to stay where I was. And we went in that direction. If you, you may be a homemaker, begin to cook under the anointing. I mean, you may be a teacher, teach under the anointing. You know, you may be an instructor, whatever you do. And let's begin a process today that you will build on this apostolic foundation so that come this summer, we will have the first salvo. We will see the first breakthrough. That invitation by the mayor still stands. Come every week, he said. I take that one. I don't let that go. The devil will have to try to get it away from me. So would you close your eyes for a moment? Forget about me and listen to the Holy Spirit. He's speaking to you and he's challenging you to believe that the city can be changed. And whether you live in San Francisco or not, the word I bring to you is this is where it will begin. And if you're willing to say yes to the Lord, Tell him that right now. You may say, but Ed, is a tall order. I have so many challenges. Well, Mary felt that way. And she asked the Asia, how can this be? I'm a single person. I'm a virgin. And what did the angel say? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And he will deposit a seed. And the rest will happen. So if you are willing to say what Mary said to the angel, let the will of God be done. I don't know how, but I know what. I am willing to give him my wound to become pregnant with transformation. If you're willing to do that, stand up where you are, where you are lift up both your arms and tell the Lord, Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done. Tell him in a loud voice, let your will be done. Yes, 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 yes. Holy Spirit, baptize him now. Baptize him now, Lord. Holy Spirit, baptize him now, now, now. Fill them with your presence. Take a deep breath. Hold it. And now exhale. You have been co-opted by God. Remain there. And if I can invite Ruth to join me here. And... Uh, Dave and Sue and Eric and Jill, would you join me as well? And Pastor Clean and Pastor Jenny, Jennifer, you are such a gift. You are such a gift. And we would like to honor you publicly. I mean, God sent you to the Bay Area. We have been laboring in the Bay Area for over 40 years, and we welcome you. We welcome you as apostles who are laying down a foundation, as people that have built a foundation. This church, this ecclesia, will be phenomenal. There will be so many millennials here, so much creativity, so much prosperity. So, Jen and Clint. You are God's instrument. And we bless you, and in blessing you, we bless your children. And we bless your grandchildren. 
and you will see the prosperity of God in your family. And every stronghold is being pulled down and your family will be on fire for God. You will prosper in so many ways. So, Father, let it be known in heaven and on earth that everything you have given to us, we pass on to Clint and Jennifer. Double, Lord. Double. Double, Lord. In Jesus' name. And now, Jen and Clint, if you face the congregation, I would like you to invite your leaders to come forward if they feel like it. We have the leaders who are taking the accelerator and the board and the pastoral staff and their wives. So if you're in the accelerator, you're a board member, pastoral staff, any of those three come forward. Yeah, that's, I'm just overwhelmed by all of you leaders. Uh, first of all, this is not a hierarchy struggle, structure where you have the triangle at the top. We flipped it upside down, and we're at the bottom. And we're here to serve you. Jen and I are here to serve you as leaders. And uh, you are a gift to this body. I've said this many times. This, this, church, leaders, this church is a, of a leadership team in itself. It's like we were just given all of these leaders. And so you are a gift to this body. And I just want the body to recognize that these leaders serve as a gift to you. They serve as a gift to you. They're not over you. They're not a ruler to rule over you. They're here to serve you and to impart into you. And so, Father, we just bless these leaders in the name of Jesus, these fathers, mothers, these men and women, Lord. Lord, that you have anointed them for such a time as this, Lord. Lord, that transformation is coming to our city. And Lord, many of these have sown years into this city, Father. They've sown many hours of prayer into this city, Father. And Lord, we just lay hands on them, uh, commissioning, equipping, and just honoring them, just recognizing them as the leaders to this body. Lord, I thank you that uh, you're raising up fathers and mothers in this city, Lord. In a city that has uh, not had fathers and mothers, you've given us so many strong fathers and mothers. And we just pray your blessing over them. And folks, we're going to ask them to pray for everybody here, but I have something for you. And it's the anointing for extraordinary miracles. But before I do that, your name, brother? Leo, Leo come here. Leo, you have been so faithful for so many years. And you are a pure, you are a Barnabas. You carry an anointing of faithfulness. And your desires, your dreams, your tears have been noticed by God. And God is elevating you, brother. And I pray for the Caleb anointing. I pray that that anointing comes upon you and you will conquer a mountain that no one else dare conquer before. Yes, brother. Yes, brother. And you and Pastor Clint and Pastor Jen are that threefold core. You have been so faithful. You carry so much historically. And because you submit and you obey and you serve, God will grant you special blessings. Mm -hmm. And you will see them more clearly in your family. Every desire for your family will be fulfilled as a son of this brother. Father, I know you told me to confirm the anointing for miracles. 
And I pray that this couple are the forerunners. They will see miracles, Lord. And they will pass them on to others because they love to serve. Yes, Lord. And Father, now for all these leaders that are here, it's not your choice. It's God's choice. He chose you. You are a prisoner of God. Tell him, Lord, I want it, and I receive it, and I receive it. Folks, you are wonderful. You will be before kings and queens. Amen. 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 Father, we release the anointed for extraordinary miracles. Begin to pray for miracles and pray and pray. It's like prophesying over dry bones. Pray, pray, pray until something happens. And once it happens, it keeps happening. And if it's okay, Pastor Clint, if we can have the leaders face the congregation now, would you face the congregation? Would you like to receive a blessing? Put your hands before God. You stretch your hands toward them. And brother, you pray a prayer on behalf of the leadership for everyone. Mm. Lord, you love this city. You've loved it since you created it. A city that is a merciful city. And Lord, we've allowed as a church to let the enemy have more of this city than we ever should have had it. And so, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for not loving the city the way you love this city. And, Lord, today that you would change our hearts, <clears throat> that we would rise up in the faith that you've given us and the authority that you've given us, and we would begin to love our city well. Lord, that we would not be ashamed of the small start that we would not be ashamed of the, the time that it might take, but that we would step forward and step again and step again. And that we would do it not as individuals, Lord, but as a team, as a family. That we would love a city that is supposed to be a family. And that we would love it as a family to see it transformed. And so, Father, we invite you to knit us together. Not that we would be comfortable, but that we would be transformational in our city that we would love every neighborhood, we would love every person, that we would, we would give to them as you give to them. And Lord, that you would empower us with a supernatural, that we would demonstrate to people who don't believe that there is a good God, that there is one, that you love them. And Lord, that we would have the resource to do that, that we would not run short of time and energy and money, that we would not run short of patience with the process, yes. that we would run with endurance the race that is set before us yes. because you did that, and we follow in your footsteps. Lord, make us little Jesus ones Amen. to our city, Amen. that we would see it transformed because, Jesus, that's what you do. You transform us. You transform those who call you Lord and Savior, and so we do that today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And we say, San Francisco, arise and shine Amen. in the name of Jesus. The day of your salvation has come. Amen. Come on. How many of you enjoyed Dr. Ed today being with us? I really feel like something spiritual was taking place this morning that God is... Uh, He's aligning us spiritually, and we're getting ready for breakthrough here, and, uh, and so God's doing that. If you need prayer, I'm going to ask Jeff if the, end, the prayer team would come up. Uh, let them lay hands on you, pray for you. If you're not wanting them to lay hands on you or you're wanting to step six feet back, just stay six feet back and say, pray for me right here, okay? So, but if you want them to, they will. And we're going to dismiss you, and God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday.